uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure being here. And um, let me, I will talk um, not only about transport, I will give you a broader picture and uh, give you a very short glimpse on what Siemens is about. But I will very much talk about uh, the way how, what, how smart cities look like or what infrastructure means to cities, which is a very important element, not only for managing cities, but also for the global economies. Very quickly, Siemens uh, company, 75 billion revenue, 350,000 people worldwide, and we are organizing ourselves according to divisions. We have the, the energy divisions, um, energy management is everything about grids, buildings, mobility, uh, this is uh, maybe the most important division for this particular session here. We have our industry divisions and we do scanners, uh, computer demographs, MRs. And if you go to a hospital and you've got uh, a scan, it's most probably a Siemens scanner which will do the job. Well, with that, um, let me um, show you. This is maybe one slide which shows our strategy, but I think it's important uh, for all of our businesses and also for the area, area we are talking about. Actually, we, we do see there is a strong trend in terms of electrification, automation and digitalization. That happens, by the way, in the transport area um, as we speak. Um, we are talking about the whole value chain. That means from power generation to transmission distribution to the if, uh, energy efficient use or the consumers, which could be industries, which could be cities and buildings. Um, the healthcare area, and most importantly on the left side you see a couple of global trends which are really important in shaping uh, our businesses and our environment tremendously. Globalization, I will, I will not touch too much. Um, demographic change is, a, is one of the big drivers. Uh, our populations are aging, um, which has a lot of impact also on the transport area. Um, and, we, and we talk autonomous driving, uh, we should also not forget elderly people, which would be really, for them it would be really a blessing to be able to move, which they, and individually, uh, what they couldn't do before. Um, but demographic change has another very strong burden on our industries because we see that the amount of labor is going down and this leaves us with a productivity gap for the next 50 years of 1.5% which can be filled only with other measures, and one of them is industrial productivity or urbanization, which I come to in a minute. Um, climate change, another topic, which is also linked to transport. Um, a lot of emissions coming from transport, from the transport sector, of course, also from the residential or, or the building area, um, as well as the, the um, um, energy. And uh, we see that uh, heading for COP21 in Paris, we see that the climate, a change of climate with maybe two and a half degrees or already embedded in our system, even if we deploy all technologies we have in hand, um, that's unavoidable. I think the trick would be now to really limit it to that level because if we won't act now dramatically, um, our globe might, might warm up to five or even six degree and that would cause a lot of disaster. Remember, two and a half degrees would raise the sea level by 40 to 50 centimeters, which is somehow okay for most of the cities. 70% of the cities are exposed to water lines, by the way. Um, everything above and beyond that would be really a disaster, econ economically, uh, but also for the people. But um, digitalization and urbanization are the two trends which we believe um, above and beyond increasing population, which is a difficult uh, for many, many countries. So digitalization, urbanization are the, the productivity drivers uh, which are not only taking care that we have still have livable cities, but they also take care for sustainable growth of economies. Which brings me to that, what we call Internet of Things. You can call it Industry 4.0. Many people talk about manufacturing Industry 4.0. For us, this is a trend which is really cutting across all our business, which, which we are acting in and which you might acting as well, including the transport. It's manufacturing, we know that. The whole world is going to be digitalized before we are going into a, a life model of the world. The energy, the grid, the energy system is changing tremendously from central to more decentral. The, the whole grid is running in both directions, meanwhile. Um, infrastructure, uh, I will talk about it, healthcare. Um, have in mind that the spending on healthcare, for example, for the United States is on a level of close to 20% of their GDP, ever increasing, by the way. Um, the trend to reverse it is 
partially and, and, and mo most importantly, um, IT technologies, logistics, think about the last mile, which is really a big, big burden for many, many cities, buildings, another area, living, smart cities. The whole thing comes together um, in the way how we are looking at cities and when we talk about smart cities, um, very often we, it's, it's nice to talk about it, but if you ask what is, what is, what, what's, what is, it, what is it really, um, you don't get a good answer. India wants to build 100 of them and when I was asking uh, uh, the, the, the Minister for, for Buildings and for City Development, actually I could not really get a good answer of what a smart city is. Um, my interpretation of a smart city is a livable, sustainable growing city. So it's nothing about technologies, it's about a livable and sustainable growing city. That means it's a city which creates jobs, which attracts people, and people want to live there. Why is it so important? Because we see that cities are competing against each other. Um, they are competing against each other for jobs, for money, um, and for talents. And the importance of talents is you cannot underestimate to get good people into a city, into a city environment is mandatory. Maybe a small anecdote, uh, I was once on a, in a city conference, a lot of mayors have been there, and then one of the urban planners was asked, um, how can I build a great city? And then he said, well, it's rather simple, build a good university, get the best professors, and wait for 20 years. So therefore, um, attracting talents um, is one of the big elements, and by the way, these talents, they can choose where they want to live. Um, you don't get them not only for money, but you get them because you offer a livable place. Um, which brings me, I mean, and wh why, is it, why is this Internet of Things so important? It's, about, it's, it's just a productivity driver. Remember, 1.5% of a productivity gap is because of low, uh, less and less labor are in the market. And uh, that has to be closed uh, by this, this kind of revolution the digital revolution, its efficiency, productivity, time to market, resilience, reliability, all these benefits you can get if you deploy the technology wisely. Let's talk about smart cities for a minute. Um, a smart city, again, of course, it has also to do something with technology. And ever since, we, four or five years ago, we were focusing on our business and a lot of our R&D investment on cities. And since then, I'm talking to mayors every other week um, and when, when I talk to them, it's amazing that after meet and greet, we have a couple of topics we are talking about and they're all the same. And we start also in the same sequence. And the sequence is how to move people and goods in a city. Topic number one. Number two is how to provide energy and in a, in a, in a, in a sustainable way, with, including reducing CO2. Most of the cities, by the way, do have a CO2 reduction target, which is as aggressive as uh, it can be, including go to zero. The third one would then be about water and waste and local emissions. And number four is, you won't believe it, but it's, uh, it's the, 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 for, uh, the, the most important element in order to compete, it's how to create a secure and livable city. Nobody wants to live in a city where you cannot go out at night, so security is one of the key elements to be competitive. So when we talk about then uh, mobility or, or the, the technologies, and meanwhile I guess you, you had a, a quick glance on that chart, it's about a lot of things which we can do already today, uh, but very often they don't come together, which is another learning when we're talking and working with cities most of the problems um, are laid already in the very early stage of um, a long-term planning. Um, so cities which are performing well, they do have a very long-term planning. And by the way, they are also executing along these lines and don't change it every fourth year when legislation is changing. So, um, and when we talk about a proper planning, um, it's not only technology, it's also about just the way how you set up a city. Uh, we found out um, that if you do not plan for enough public space, and that would mean lower than 30%, or maybe too much, which would be above 40, then if you plan too low, you create slums. If you plan too high, the city is not affordable anymore. So we have to have a right balance between public space and the space where you have buildings or, or, or other things. And the other one, the other failure which we very often see is very often and this is in most cases, unfortunately, 
uh, the execution of the plans is in silos. So the Ministry for Transport doesn't talk to the Ministry for Housing, he doesn't talk to the Minister of Energy, or if they talk, then they have different agendas and they don't get along with each other. So I'm pretty sure in Adelaide it's completely different. Um, you, you, you solve that problem. Um, but again, uh, this is a very decisive element. Think about how uh, electric vehicles, um, they would really bring transport and the energy system together. There are much, much more examples. A lot of technologies are there. They are developing as we speak. And uh, um, the minister was sharing a lot of uh, technology trends, which is exactly what happens. Uh, you're really on the, sitting on the right spot. And um, one point very often, and I have to, have, to, have to give you this one, one technical, more technical thing because I believe it's important. Um, very often when we talk about smart cities, there are companies who are saying, which have just to gather data, analyze them, and that's it. Um, actually, we, are, we have a, a slightly different point of view. And what I'm showing here is this pyramid, which you see for industry, for manufacturing industry, but also for transport. What you see here, you have the first layer of a system. This is basically the hardware layer. It's, uh, it's the tunnels you drill for a metro, it's the rails you're laying, but it's also the sensors and actuators which you do have. Um, a sensor is a lot of sensors in your trains, in your cars, uh, actuators are cars, are propulsion systems, all that stuff which ultimately generates data. 80 to 90% of the money you're putting in your system sits on this first layer. The next layer is the next level of intelligence. It's the automation layer. Modern signaling system is one idea, traffic management systems, which is maybe doing a lot of, a lot of good things to your system. And then on top of that comes the real digital layer where you're creating out of massive data, valuable data, uh, which requires a certain level of intelligence and understanding what happens in the lower layers without understanding how your sensors are functioning, without understanding of what you're doing really there on the ground, you cannot really create the benefits. And ultimately, you create the benefits for all stakeholders, um, which is the city, um, it's the people living in there, it's the companies working there. So with 10 to 20%, and this is the good news of incremental investment, you can leverage a tremendous amount of money sitting on the ground, which you spend a lot. And I would like to give you, this was a little bit academic, I might give you a couple of examples. For example, and these are now really examples which were Siemens were engaged in Metro uh, business. We changed line one in Paris from driver to driverless, and we can, could increase the capacity by 50% just in changing. This is, uh, the, the metro of Munich was built to serve 200,000 people per day. Today, it serves seven to 800,000 without any additional tunnel, no new line. It's the same system, but you run it in a completely different way. In London, we're working with London now since seven years, and we started off in a combination of a connection to the airport, of road pricing, uh, and, uh, one word later on the road pricing, which is a very interesting one. Um, we did um, ex equip buses with hybrid propulsion systems as well as GPS systems. So this combination was enabling us to number one, increase the traffic flow by 37%, the inflow of cars reducing by 20 um, 150,000 tons of CO2 reduced and above and beyond, it's a constant revenue stream for the city. So it's really a lot of benefits. Um, uh, talking about the grid, if you really, if you run a modern grid in a city and it has a complete different challenge, if you go for prosumers, which are building, which are consuming energy and producing energy at the same time, you will see that you have a grid which is some, sometimes running reverse. So you feed in more power than you, than you fi finally consume. That means the grid runs in the, in the other direction. So you need to stabilize it, you need to have some storage to, and peak storage, and you can inc increase the reliability of a grid. And for example, here in the state of Maharashtra, we are equipping now uh, the grid with modern uh, um, automation technologies after having a blackout of 600 million people uh, living without power for a couple of hours or even days. So that's, that's very difficult. And talking about buildings, in Taipei 101, this is not the largest building or the tallest building, but it's, it's the most, uh, um, uh, most green building. It has a platinum lead status for such a high building, the only one in the world, and we could reduce the energy consumption by 18%. Um, 
Uh, there are much, much more examples, and maybe one more to mention, talking about the, the energy system, that um, when uh, we, we equipped a borough in New York, in the Bronx, with a decent electrical system, uh, it was um, it's somehow independent, and when Sandy was running over New York, this was a borough which, could, which was running without any blackouts through the whole system, so high resilience is also part of the game. Well, with that, let me close in giving you a kind of a perspective on, on the world. Um, digital transformation is changing our world and many, many of our businesses quite a bit. And um, the question which I would like to answer here is, and many of them I'm, I'm asked very often, why does it happen today? I mean, remember, the World Wide Web was invented in the late 90s, so we were connecting people at that time. Why is it that not before that, not before the last years, we are connecting now the devices? And I try to give you an answer. Number one is requirements. The pressure on productivity is getting tougher and tougher. And um, one, one place where you really could feel it every day is China. Again, China's labor market peaked already. They're going down and they're having a productivity gap, which they have to close. Industry 4.0, manufacturing industry 4.0 is the name of the game. Number one. Number two, technology. The de technology is developing extremely fast. We are talking about connection. Could we, we are talking about field devices, connecting devices. Today, you, today, if you have a wireless field device, a sensor, it costs you $4. In five years from now, it will cost you half of it. One, maybe two. Um, talking about Moore's law, you know, that Moore's law saying within 18 months the processing power doubles. Believe it or not, it's still active. And you can see it, I was recently in the United States visiting a data center, a big one. Every week you see a truck coming in, a truck loaded with servers. They scrap the old ones and bring in new ones. Uh, this is the speed with which they develop the, the, um, the, the processing power of, of servers. Um, and big data, algorithms. A lot of companies are investing quite a bit in really creating new algorithms, new data in order to really create value out of the data. This was the requirements and the technical part. And there's another part, and I think David will love it, from Uber, I think, uh, I don't know, I didn't see him. Here we go, he will love it. There are new business models. There are new business models which are disrupting the way how we do business. I mean, I know that we will talk about the, the business model of Uber in a minute. I'll give you another one. Uh, this is the way how we are using cars. Today, you buy a car for, I don't know, it depends on your, on your uh, um, behavior, maybe $30,000, could be $100,000, $30,000, and actually, you're moving then two tons, um, most of the time with an individual driver, your car, in average, is used by 5% of its time. And by the way, you spend a lot of money and you don't get what you need. So what you need if you go to shopping uh, in, in, the, in the town, you need a small one. If you want to go for skiing over the weekend, you need an all-wheel drive, a big one. If you go on a sunny day with your wife or your beloved one, you need a cabrio. So actually, you never get what you really need. So this is where car sharing comes in place, where you're just sharing cars. And in Munich, 34% of households don't have a car anymore, and car sharing is really booming. So think about this is what, when I'm talking about changing business models, uh, that, that's what happens. And what that, what that does, it changes the way how we develop, develop business from a linear way to an exponential way. And again, I'm pretty sure that David will talk about Uber, Airbnb, a company, after their couple of years of existence, they have uh, five times more booking than uh, hired globally. So, and by the way, they even don't have any real estate in their portfolio. They just rent out your flat if you want to do that. Um, other examples, and you talked about it in particular in the transport sector, coming, showing up now on the right side, um, distributed energy systems, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, autonomous driving. I, b I believe this is m one of the most disruptive change which we're going to see in the transport area. Um, also changed along that with business models and, and autonomous robots, there are a lot of things. The transportation system will look differently, it has to look differently. And last word, um, and uh, when I talk to mayors I, uh, of cities with one million inhabitants or more, I tell them sooner or later you will not get around without having a road pricing because you need to manage your system, you manage the traffic, and the best way to manage traffic is really increasing the price, 
and, but then you have to offer public transport at the same time, otherwise it will not go anywhere. With that, thank you very much for your attention.